Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today, inshallah, we start with hadith number 40. An ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma qala akhadha rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam biman kabi wa qal kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharibun aw abiru sabilin wa kan ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma yaqul idha amsayta fala, tat- fala tantadir sabah وَإِذَا أَصْبَحْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرِ الْمَسَاءِ وَخُذْ مِنْ صُحَّتِكَ لِمَرَضِكَ وَمِنْ حَيَاتِكَ لِمَوْتِكَ رواه البخاري. The narration is from Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma. He says, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held me by my shoulder and said, Be in this world as a stranger or a wayfarer. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu would then say, when you, when you enter into the evening, do not wait for the morning. And when you enter into the morning, do not wait for the evening. Take advantage of your health before times of sickness, and take advantage of your life before your death. The hadith is narrated by Imam al-Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. We see that here Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi is bringing this beautiful hadith to us summarizing the reality of life. The 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi were about principles. Principles that if we implement, if we embody in ourselves, we will find success. And now as Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi finishes off the book, as he's closing off the book, after going through uh, issues of, 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 uh, of, of, of fiqh, after going through issues of mu'amalat, mu'asharat, after going through Imaniyat, he's now summarizing and simplifying things. And one of the things that Imam Nabi Rahmatullahi Ali dedicates this hadith to is the importance of detaching from this world. Because if you are attached to the distraction, you'll never be able to focus on your purpose in life. And one of our teachers would say, Shaitan's goal is to make you forget your goal. Shaitan's goal is to distract you. As long as you are distracted, Shaitan is successful. You know, that's why you'll find in some narrations that when a person is distracted through something, the Prophet ﷺ would refer to that thing that was distracting the person as Shaitan. Just today earlier we were studying uh, Mishkat al Masabih, and the narration came that there was a person who was following a bird around for hunting purposes. Meaningless hunting. It wasn't so that he could, you know, eat the meat, he was just doing it for fun. So the Prophet ﷺ said, a shaitan is following a shaitan. This person is a shaitan because he's become a victim of shaitan. And the bird, the reason why the bird is being referred to as shaitana is because the, sh- the bird was being used by shaitan to distract this person. So keeping focus, this is a very important thing. Before we get into the actual content of the hadith, um, just one or two things to point out. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh starts off the narration by saying, أَخَذَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِمَنْ كِبِي The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم held me by my shoulder. This, this action of holding someone when giving them, when teaching them something, when giving them some knowledge, is a very powerful gesture. Even counselors, they suggest that when you counsel someone, and if you want the word that you're conveying to them to be more intimate, what better way than to make physical contact? You know, a father puts his arm around his child. A person puts her hand on another person's knee. He holds another person's hand. She, she holds another person's hand. So that person understands the importance of what's being said. The Prophet ﷺ here holds on to the shoulder of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu. Similarly, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, "Allamani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at tashahuda." The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me tashahud. And while he was teaching me tashahud, uh, my hand was between his hands. He was holding me by the hand as he was teaching me this very important dua of a tashahud that we read in our salah, at tahiyatu lillah wa salawat wa tayyibat. Similarly, there's a narration from Mujahid, rahimahullah. He was seen grieved. He was very sad. فَقِيلَ لَهُ مَا لَكَ حَزِينَ Someone asked him, why are you so sad? فَقَالَ He said, تَذَكَّرْتُ قَوْلَ ابْنَ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ قَوْلَ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ That I just remember the statement of Abdullah. Abdullah meaning his teacher. 
And Mujahid's teacher was Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He said, I just remembered the statement of my teacher, أَخَذَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِكَفِّي بَيْنَ كَفَّيْهِ That one day the Prophet ﷺ held my hand between his two hands. Ibn Abbas says, One day the Prophet ﷺ held my palm, my hand between his two hands. وقال, ya Abdullah, and then he said, Oh Abdullah, كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ وَعَابِرُ السَّبِيلٌ A very similar hadith to what Ibn Umar is narrating in this hadith number 40 of Imam Nabawi rahmatullahi alayhi's 40 hadith collection. Uh, Mujahid and Ata were from amongst the um, great students of Ibn Abbas an, and were the people who took from his tafsir and took from his knowledge. Similarly, we see that when Jibreel alayhi salam came to study from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam some questions publicly, as we learned from Hadith Jibreel, ala that he placed his hands on his thighs. Uh, if you remember, at the beginning of our Arba'in Nabawi class, we discussed the different possibilities of who he and he is. And he placed his hands on his thighs. Who are these the Ma'ir referring to? And one of the possibilities was, the Messenger of Allah placed his hand on the thighs of Jibreel alayhi salam. Or Jibreel alayhi salam placed his hand on the, on the thighs of the Messenger of Allah. That very same intimate um, connection they're building as they're teaching one another as they're learning from one another. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us that be in this world as a stranger. Know that in this world, you and I are strangers. And what does a stranger do? Why is the Prophet ﷺ referring to us as strangers and as travelers? Reflect over that a little bit. Is my life in this world the life of a stranger and traveler? Or have I set my roots in this world? Am I not willing to leave? Have I made a mistake? If you saw someone that was traveling from one part of the world to another part, and they stopped over in Turkey, and they walked into the business lounge, and the business lounge in Turkey, by the way, is one of the best business lounges in the world. And you walk in there, and you're getting the shoulder rub, and you're getting fresh kebabs coming out of the oven in front of you in this lounge, and there's you know, a beautiful theater there, and there's, you know, they have sports playing, and you have a pool table there, and all sorts of amazing meals, and a nice resting place, and a nice shower there. And you think to yourself, man, forget about that business trip in Italy. I'm just going to sleep here. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay here. Spend my life here. This person would be a fool by consensus. Everyone would call this person a fool. You know, family members would call this person. Relatives would go and meet this person. The parents would go and fly out to Istanbul and say, "We're going back home. You're not staying here. This is not life. This is not reality. This is a stopover. You're being fooled." So the messengers of Allah came with this very same goal because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent the insan to go to the original abode of the insan. And the original abode of the insan is where our parents were first sent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَا آدَمَ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Adam alayhi salam and our mother Hawa to Jannah. And due to a mistake, they were taken out of Jannah. So our abode is Jannah. Our abode is the hereafter, not this dunya. This dunya is just a pathway. We're just cutting through, we're crossing through. And many of us have forgotten that this is a stopover. We've forgotten that this is a gas station. That the value of this world is nothing more than a motel. It's nothing more than an IHOP. It's nothing more than, you know, your Shell or, or, or your BP or 7-Eleven. That's what this dunya is. But how many of us have been fooled into believing this was the destination? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent messengers and messengers just as a parent would send, would call repeatedly to tell their child that you're making a mistake. That is not your abode. You're getting confused. You're being fooled. Allah sends Nabi after Nabi, Wahi after Wahi, Rasul after Rasul, to remind us that this wasn't where you're supposed to be. Utilize this world. But know that this is not the end. The human being transitions through different abodes. The scholars, they say, the human being's journey starts in Alam al-Arwah. And then it enters into Alam al-Dunya. And then transitions into Alam al-Barzakh. And ultimately, it will reach its destination in Alam al-Akhirah. Alam al-Arwah is the world of the souls where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the souls of every living being. Alam al-Dunya is the world that we live in right now. Alam al-Barzakh is a transition between this world and the hereafter, otherwise also known as the Qabr. And then Alam al-Akhirah is the final and true abode. So what are some characteristics of a traveler? Uh, a traveler, when he travels, 
they always ensure that they travel lightly. No one travels heavily. When a person is going from here to Houston and they take 10 suitcases with them, we would laugh at that person. What are you doing? It's just a short trip. All you need is a bottle of water, make sure you have a credit card and drive. What more do you want? It's only a three hour, four hour drive from Dallas to Houston. So this, this period in the dunya, the Quran refers to it as being a very short period. Like the blink of an eye. Kalam hil basar. Like a blink of an eye. And your life passes by. Ask a person who's lived their time in the dunya and they'll tell you, I don't even know where it went. Last thing I remember, I was graduating from high school. And here I am now with one foot in the grave already. The traveler travels lightly. The second thing, the traveler ensures that the pathway he's taking to his destina destination is the most effective pathway. A traveler doesn't want to go on a long pathway. He doesn't want to go on a dangerous pathway. He doesn't want to go on a pathway that is polluted with robbers. He wants to ensure that he's going on a pathway that takes him directly to his destination at the quickest pace, at the quickest pace, and ensuring that there is no danger lying on that pathway. If you knew that the pathway is piled up with an accident, would you take the road? I wouldn't take the road, you wouldn't take the road. So when you're traveling through this world, ensure that the pathway that you're taking to your abode is the safest one from shaitan. It's the quickest one by the ittiba of the sunnah. And it's not a dangerous one where you surround yourself by people who are constantly trying to push you, push you off of the road. They're constantly trying to hit you off of the road and make you uh, have an accident. When a traveler travels, more so in older days, and even now actually, actually now more than those days, when you travel, the one thing you always make sure you have is a guide. Do any of you guys remember maps, those maps that you'd get from AAA? You'd have them in your glove compartment when you travel before navigations came out. If you were going from one place to another, you had these different maps of different parts of America, and there were some more maps. There were maps that were focused on a city, and some maps that focused on a region. And then there were these, you know, nationwide and worldwide maps that people would use to navigate. Anyone remember those maps? No, kind of. You always ensure that you had those maps because if you didn't have that map, you would get lost. Uh, in our day and age, we use navigation. People want to go from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. If they're looking for their friend's house, they're looking for our relative's home, they're looking for their child's school and they miss the exit, what's the first thing they pull out? Mm -hmm. They pull out their navigation. Because without your navigation, you're going to be lost. You're going to end up in the wrong place. So always, the traveler always makes sure, makes sure that he or she has their guide with them. And that's what the Qur'an actually is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an, هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ this Qur'an is your guidance. You let go of this Qur'an, you'll be lucky to reach your destination. You'll be lucky to reach your destination. You need to hold on to it, and you need to hold on to it firmly, and you need to bite onto it with your molar, and ensure that you do not let go of the Qur'an and Sunnah. You let go of these with your molar, and shaitan is just going to rip them out. Someone, you leave your window open, someone comes and pulls your phone and runs away, you're in trouble. How are you going to get to your destination? Similarly, the traveler during the travel focuses on reaching their homeland, reaching their destination. That's their main goal. The only thing that consumes their mind during the trip is, I can't wait to meet my wife. I can't wait to meet my kids. A person is returning back from Hajj. All he's thinking is, man, it's been so long since I've been at home. So throughout the journey, what's the one thing they're thinking of? You can put all the movies you want on in a plane, you can try to distract people as much as you want on the plane, but what are they thinking? If you were to tell someone, you know what, this plane's gonna be five hours longer and we're gonna put five movies on for you, will they be happy with that? No, because what's their mind focused on? It's on reaching their destination. That I wanna reach my homeland, I wanna reach my destination. A traveler is not content with being a traveler. He doesn't like being a traveler. Because as-safaru qita'atum min al-adab. Uh, traveling is an element of punishment. The Prophet ﷺ says that when a person travels, they are prevented from their sleep, prevented from their food, prevented from their drink. You will get drink, you will get food, but it won't be your food. You'll get sleep, but it won't be your sleep. All of that comes when you reach home. 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِذَا قَضَى أَحَدُكُمْ نَهْمَتَهُ So when one of you accomplishes his goal and fulfills his need that he actually went on the journey for, فَلْيُعَجِّلْ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِي Then let him hurry back, let her hurry back to her family. Get back to your family quickly. So our goal needs to be to, be, to not be too comfortable in the dunya. Because when you get too comfortable in the dunya, then you might become one of those people who decides to take the journey as the abode and forgets about the abode altogether. You might forget about... That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he warned his companions of living excessively luxurious lives. He ﷺ said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an, إِيَّاكَ وَالتَّنَعُمْ فَإِنَّ عِبَادَ اللَّهِ لَيْسُوا بِالْمُتَنَعِمِينَ Be aware of living a luxurious life. Because the true friends of Allah don't enjoy luxury in this world. They've saved their luxury in the hereafter. Similarly, a traveler doesn't lose hope and doesn't give up if they face a little difficulty while traveling. Because the nature of traveling is difficulty. So while they're traveling, if they get a little hungry, they accept that this is the nature of traveling. I'm going to be hungry. They're not disappointed. You know, they're willing to forbear the difficulty. And the dunya is a journey. And you will face difficulties. There will be problems. You might miss out on opportunities. But don't lose your heart over it. Just because you didn't get what you wanted, doesn't mean that you give up on everything. You can't stop. You're just cutting through. You're passing by. You know, my sheikh used to give this beautiful example. He would say, look how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows every human being to enter into this world on sound nature, fitrah, Islam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, all you have to do is what I'm giving you, keep it with you, preserve it, keep it safe, meet me on the other end of your life with Islam, and I'll give you Jannah. You understand? Allah says, I'm giving you Islam at the beginning of the trip, all you have to do is, Keep it safe. That's all you have to do. Meet me on the other side of the trip, on the other side of the journey, at the time of your death. Say, La ilaha illallah before you die, and I'll give you Jannah. That's all you need to do. Right? And then our Shaykh would say, Now the question is, under what circumstances will you live and will you put yourself through? There's one person who protects himself, and as a result of that, their La ilaha illallah, that ticket that they were given, you know, Allah gives you a ticket and says, Show up at the ride and you'll get the ride. That ticket they have, they preserve it. They put it in a nice box, they keep it in a safe space. They don't let anything dangerous come near that ticket because they value that ticket. It's locked away in a safe box, in a vault, in a bank to make sure nobody steals their jewelry, their, their, their desired product, their valued product, their precious product. And on the other hand, there are some of us who are walking around flaunting it. It's windy, there are robbers everywhere. You know, the pathway isn't safe and we're waving it around saying, this is my iman, this is my iman. And the chances are, unfortunately, for some of us, this ticket will be torn. And if this ticket is torn, when you come to Allah on the Day of Judgment, there will be a need for a patch job, unless Allah shows His fadl. Allah may demand that I wish for you to patch this iman. And that may come in the form of, you know, some sort of uh, difficulty and, uh, and, and punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. And if a person brings that ticket in its sound nature and form to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the desirable way that Allah always wanted you to bring it, then you will find your promise with Allah. Allah will always fulfill His promise. Now, what are signs that a person is attached to the dunya? What are some signs that I am overly attached or you are overly attached to this world? This is a very dis uh, difficult discussion to have, by the way. It's a very difficult discussion. Because to some degree each and every one of us has a level of attachment. And the truth is, that attachment is actually necessary. Because without that attachment, we wouldn't be able to live. So, when we talk about detaching from the dunya, it's not about living a life of carelessness where you aren't fulfilling your responsibilities. Detaching has less to do with actions and more to do with perspective. More to do with attitude. What's your attitude? There's one person who works hard every day, brings a good earning home every day, but their attitude is that they're not slaves of the dunya. They'll pray salah when salah time comes, they'll go for hajj when hajj is obligated. You know, when it's time to give zakat, they won't be hesitant, they'll give it. There's another person who may not bring as much as money home, 
But their attitude speaks as if they've become slaves of the dunya. They've become servants of this dunya. They're willing to travel from one city to another, one state to another, one part of the world to another because of a job obligation, but find it very hard to travel from one city to another for the sake of learning the deen, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for a good cause. They find it very difficult. How many times have you heard someone saying that I can't leave my home city and go to another city for studying because that's too difficult. But yet at the same time, they do it in a heartbeat for a job. They do it five days a week, every week of the year if they had to for a job. So setting your priorities, it's an attitude. The Prophet ﷺ is demanding a very particular attitude from Abdullah bin Umar when he, when he says to him, Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib. Be in this world as a stranger, or abiru sabid, or as someone that is passing by. Nonetheless, the scholars have listed certain signs of a person that is overly attached to the dunya. In the Hilya, it is written that one of the signs of a person not being attached to this world is that you will not care for the praise of people. You will not care for the praise of people. Rather, you will yearn for the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, the scholars, they say, one of the signs of being overly attached to this world is that a day passes by and your heart hasn't yearned the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask a mother whose child lives in another state, going to college there. A day doesn't pass by, but she thinks of her child at the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day, and at the end of the day. And she refuses to go to sleep until she calls her child. And if this is the love that a mother has for her child, shouldn't, be the love, this, shouldn't this be the love that a servant has for his master? That a day doesn't pass by, but he calls on to Allah by saying, Allahu Akbar. That he goes into sajda and says, Ya Allah, I truly miss you. Ya Allah, this life has been very difficult. Who do I complain to, Ya Allah? I'm a traveler. You sent me here. But soon I will reach my destination. And when I reach there, Al-Wafa, Al-Wafa. Ya Allah, fulfill your promise and fully reward me. Another sign the scholars list as a sign of being overly attached to the dunya is that all a person cares about is accumulation of worldly possessions while caring nothing at all for accumulating for the hereafter. You know, there is a volume of time that a person dedicates to their worldly endeavors. Some of us work eight hours a day, seven hours a day, nine hours a day, 12 hours a day. You know, people work. They have to. They have obligations. But is there an equivalent form of investment in the akhirah? I'm willing to invest eight hours a day to, to, to my dunya, and that's okay. What you're doing is halal, keep doing it. But is there an equal investment in my akhirah? I'm, I, you know, I, I give my day and night to prepare for my MCATs. That's awesome. For my step one, awesome. But is there any preparation for me? Is there any preparation for my test in front of Allah? As Allah says, يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That on that day, mankind will be made to stand in front of their Lord. And on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question every person, have I reached a place, such a level of attachment to this world that the minor examinations prepared by human beings are more tempting and they're more effective on me in my heart than the examination prepared by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will ask, you know, did you pray your salah? How did you spend your life? وَعَنْ عُمْرِهِ فِي مَا أَفْنَاهُ وَعَنْ شَبَابِهِ فِي مَا أَبْلَاهُ وَعَنْ مَالِهِ مِنْ أَيْنَ إِكْتَسَبَ وَفِي مَا أَنْفَقَهُ Allah will ask, how did you earn your wealth? What did you spend it in? Where did you spend your youth? Did you pray your salah? These are questions that will be asked by Allah. And until these questions are not answered, the human being will not have the audacity to take a step. No human being will be allowed to move without answering these questions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, the ulama, they say, one of the signs of being overly attached to the dunya is that when it comes to investing in the akhirah, doing good for the hereafter, there is procrastination, pushing off. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll go for hajj next year. I'll pray my salah tomorrow. I'll pray my salah later on. Not at the beginning of the time, rather I'll pray it at the end of the time. There's a halaqah going on in the community. Ah, the halaqah isn't going anywhere. It's probably going to get 
uh, recorded anyway, it's probably going to get uploaded online anyway, so what's the big deal? Procrastination. But what happens? You continue to procrastinate and procrastinate until what happens? Anyone? فَإِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهُمْ فَلَا يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ عَنْهُ سَاعَةً وَلَا يَسْتَغْدِمُونَ Death comes, death happens. And when death happens, and when it hits you, and the, you know, with, when the reality hits you, there's no delay. أَوْ تَقُولَ حِينَ تَرَ الْعَذَابِ لَوْ أَنَّ لِي كَرَّةً فَأَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Or as Allah says in the Qur'an, um, فَرْجِعْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا إِنَّا مُقِنُونَ Oh Allah says in the Qur'an, um, at the end of Surah Mumtahina, no, not Surah Mumtahina, Surah Munafiqun. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْفِقُوا yeah, right before that, the ayah starts off. Yes. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولْ رَبِّ لَوْ لَا أَخْرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ All those who believe, spend from what Allah has given you from pure wealth before death arrives. Because when it arrives, you will say, لَوْ لَا أَخْرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ Oh my Lord, give me some time, some respite. To a very short distance. Give me a little time. And I will go and give in your path. And Allah says, Allah states the, the principle. لَن يُؤَخِّرَ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا That's the qa'idah. That there is no delay. You utilize what you have now. Once time's up, you're out. And there is no reversing of that. There is no changing that. It's a reality that will occur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not defer your death even a moment. Because that was written before you even came to the dunya. Similarly, the scholars, they say, that one of the signs, another one of the signs of being overly attached to the dunya is that a person f- plans far ahead in their life without having guarantee they will even reach there. So this is a very interesting point. Because there is this idea of being wise of not dropping yourself to destruction. You don't want to leave yourself abandoned and open to a point where you reach a scenario in life that you're not prepared for. That's one thing. But there's another thing of overly committing and thinking about 20 years from now while not preparing, while not doing today. So for example, there's a person who has to give their zakat. That's an obligation from Allah. But that person thinks to himself that if I give my zakat today, I won't be able to pay off my loan 20 years from now. Or I may not be able to buy that car, or invest in that business, or open up a new practice, or finish off X, Y, and Z dream that I have, go and tour the world, or go to you know, Cancun and go on a holiday there, or go on a cruise to uh, you know, Hawaii. These are all things that I want to accomplish, and I won't be able to accomplish them. So you're so focused. You know, there's, there's an incident of a particular scholar, uh, Al-Qarqhi, Ma'ruf Al-Qarqhi. أقام معروف القرخي الصلاة ثم قال لرجل تقدم فصلي بنا. He was getting ready. He gave the iqama. They were getting ready to pray. So معروف القرخي said to a person that why don't you lead us in prayer? So that person said. فقال الرجل إني إن صليت بكم هذه الصلاة لم أصلي بكم غيرها. That if I lead you in this prayer, I won't lead you in the next one. Meaning I'll lead you in this prayer. I'll do it. But next one I won't lead. فقال معروف وَأَنْتَ تُحَدِّثُ نَفْسَكَ أَنَّكَ تُصَلِّي صَلَاةٌ أُخْرَى نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ طُولِ الْأَمَنِ He said to this person that, wow, you think you're so confident you're going to live to the next salah. And then he said, نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ طُولِ الْأَمَنِ We seek protection of Allah from Allah. We seek the protection of Allah from long hopes. So don't overestimate yourself. Don't plan too far in your life. The Prophet ﷺ while talking about tawakkul, he gives the example of a bird that leaves the nest in the morning hungry. But every day it eats and its child eats. You know? and, the, and, and the affair with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that when a person understands that the raziq and the musabib al-asbab is Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always fulfill that person's rizq and provide all of the asbab. But when you take affairs into your own hand and you, and you forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that will provide, you know, people who talk about life insurance is very interesting because for most people, life insurance is a matter of trust. That what happens to my family when I die? Allah takes care of them. Allah took care of them. Allah was taking care of them. Allah took care of you. Well, you don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable? And if you do care, work in this world and leave wiratha for them. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh is on his deathbed. Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anh comes to him. And he says, Ibn Mas'ud, you don't have a lot of wealth. 
if you give me permission as the Khalifa, I would like to appoint a stipend for your daughters. Because Ibn Mas'ud had daughters, he did not have a son. He said, I would like to, he didn't have, he had so many daughters, more like. So he said, I would like to appoint a stipend for your daughters. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, well, I don't need your stipend because I've taught them something that will save them from poverty. And you know, he asked them, what did you teach them? And he said that, I taught my daughters that every night they should read Surah Waqi'ah and they will never experience poverty. They will never experience faqa. We covered this narration in detail and its variations and its authenticity earlier on when we covered the biography of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in this very same Arba'i Nawwi class in the earlier episodes. You can go and check and study it there. Similarly, the scholars, they say that another sign of being overly attached to the world is that you regard the success of people solely, best, solely based on their worldly gains. You regard the success of people solely based on their worldly gains. This person is successful. This person is a failure. This person could have done better. This person is going to do horrible. It's all based off their worldly gains. And not focusing on what actually matters for these people is their akhirah. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. That a person who takes everything from this world but doesn't take the love of Allah has taken nothing from this world. You can hold all the credit cards you want, all the wealth you want. By Allah, every wealthy, every wealthy person that dies without the love of Allah, there is no doubt in my heart at all, his greatest regret must, have, must be that I missed the most important thing. And every, every poor person that leaves this world with the love of Allah on their deathbed, they must be so excited that I got it right. You know that person, the excitement he feels or she feels when they get the lottery, when they win the lottery? I don't know what that feels like, but I can imagine someone who wins the jackpot, hits the jackpot on the lottery, they must be so excited because they got it right. They didn't believe in themselves and they got it right. And imagine how excited that person must be that when he's dying on his deathbed, he feels, Ya Allah, I got it right. I did it. You know, I didn't, I didn't wrongly invest my time or my efforts. And the angels are standing there waiting for this person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Messenger of Allah is telling us, Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allah liqa, whoever desires and loves to meet Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also desires and loves to meet Him. So many examples, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, towards the end of his life, due to some political tension, was exiled from one of the major cities. And when he was sent into exile, he was traveling and he said, Ya Allah, the world with its vastness has become narrow on me. So take me. And soon after Ramadan passes, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi leaves the world. The beloved ones of Allah, they leave. And when they leave, there's no regret, there's no remorse. Well, for some of us, we just can't let go of the dunya. The example of our grip for the dunya is like a child holding on to their candy. They just don't want to give it up. And when you do slip it away from their hands, they cry. And when, we, when the dunya is taken away from us, we cry. Because we haven't prepared for the akhirah. The Prophet ﷺ says to Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib. Similarly, the ulama, they write, from the signs of a person being overly attached to this dunya, is that they spend, they waste too much of their time in things that don't have true benefit for them. And I want you to let that settle in. I want you to really let that settle in. In a time of Hulu and Netflix, in a time of video games being available at the tip of our fingers, in a time of Candy Crush and Angry Birds, in a time of Facebook, Insta, you know, Snap, and, and Twitter. In these times, ask yourself, how much time do we actually spend in things that don't really have true benefit to us? They're just, our time is just slipping away. As the Urdu poet said, Jagaji lagane ki dunya nahi hai, ye ibrat ki jahe tamasha nahi hai. That this world is not a place to attach yourself, it's a place of reflection, not a joke. This is a place for you, ibrat ki jahe, it's a place for you to reflect. It's a place for you to learn your lesson, for you to learn your lesson. As the Urdu poet said, dunya ke e musafir, O traveler of this world, dunya ke e musafir. O traveler of this world, do din ka ye safar hai. This is just a two-day travel. Two days and your time in this dunya will be up. What you are covering today. Uh, sorry, dunya ke e musafir, manzil teri qabar hai. That's what he said. Dunya ke e musafir, manzil teri qabar hai. Or traveler of this world, your destination is the grave. 
te kar raha hai to jo tu what you are passing today what you are covering in life today do din ka ye safar hai it's only a two day it's only a two day it's only a two day trip and um, the last thing the ulama they write is a sign of a person being overly detached i mean this isn't the last of the list this is the last of what i'm going to list you can imagine the list continuing on and there's so much to think of but the last thing that i want to list is that a person becomes obsessed with living in luxury in this dunya and they forget about the luxury of the akhirah in the hereafter you know someone asked this question that what is israf what does it mean to live a life of extravagance this is a difficult question because some scholars say israf is purely subjective for one person what's considered a necessity for another person that's considered to be israf it's considered to be you know for one person what might be a need for another person that might be extravagance and might be wasting money can a person buy you know a, you know a 5000 uh, sorry can a person buy a, a hundred thousand dollar car is that extravagance for one person it might be extravagance for another person maybe not are you guys following what i'm saying but the one thing i always tell students when when we cover this issue in class because we recently covered it in class in mishkat that I, and I tell them that there is one very easy way to understand whether you're being extravagant. Are you spending money in return of value or not? Is there value on the other side of you spending money? Are you guys following this? Let's say, for example, I have a car. Okay. My car has, a, you know, X amount of features. Now I'm getting another car. Does that second car add value to the first car? Does it bring me something that I need? Does it offer me something that I need? And if it isn't offering me something that I need, it's just the same thing at a higher price tag, right off the bat, what do you know? Right off the bat, what do you know? This is Israf. This is extravagance. Now if it does offer something, we're not done with the discussion yet. If it does offer something more than the previous one, now I need to ask myself, is this a luxury that it's offering me? Or is this something that I need? There might be a person who has back pain and they need a nice cushy chair. Okay, go ahead, get yourself that. Another person is very comfortable. The car does very well, everything is well, but... It's just time for that upgrade. You know that three-year upgrade that happens? In Amer the American car industry gets an upgrade every three years. That's why we have leases. They last three years. It's like the whole country was programmed. There was a time where people held their cars. My dad had a station wagon for 15 years. He drove that thing to the graveyard. You know, literally went to the junkyard and dropped it off there. And that was the end of that car. <laughs> I was speaking with my father. And that, that's a generation, by the way. They don't believe in this three-year business. They don't believe in this three-year nonsense. My father is old and I was, we were talking about getting him a car. It was a very sad discussion. It hurt me, this discussion I had with my dad. Because I was talking with him and he sold his previous car and he needs a car. So he said to me, Hussein, I'm looking for a car. I said, sure dad, what do you want? So he was describing it to me. And I found the exact same car with fabric seats. The exact same car, not leather seats, but it was fabric seats. And I said, Dad, I found the exact same car you wanted at better mileage, and you know, it's, you know, it's got some more bells and whistles. I mean, it's, it's a nicer car, but it doesn't have the leather, it has fabric. And my dad said to me, Hussein, you know, I've always wanted to drive a car with leather seats. And then he said that, and I fear, not I fear, but he said, I feel that this is gonna be the last car I buy in this dunya. And when he said that to me, it hit me, I was like, oh, Ya Allah, that just hurts. For me, I've taken my father for granted, but on the other hand, he's telling me that, Hussein, this might just be the last car I buy. After this, there's no more buying. And uh, I really even, he said that to me yesterday, and since yesterday, I've just been thinking about that. You know, a parent's age. But one thing I was, uh, just to connect it to what we're talking about in today's class, that really hits home is that these people held on to things. You know, they, they hold, they, and that mentality remains. They still hold on to things. In our day and age, we use it for a little, and what happens? It's time to go on. You know, I have friends who buy houses knowing that they're going to sell their house in five years so they can move to the next thing in life, you know? People are constantly looking for the next thing in life. And you've exhausted all your luxuries in this world. And compare this to the likes of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, who is serving the Muslim Ummah as a Khalifa, and one afternoon he feels thirsty, and he says to one of the servants, can you please bring some water? And the servant brings some cold water, with some honey mixed in there. And Umar radiallahu anh starts crying, and the servant says, what happened? And he says in return, that how can I drink this water that's cold with honey in it? What if Allah says to me on the Day of Judgment, أَذْهَبْتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ فِي حَيَاتِكُمُ الدُّنْيَا وَاسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهَا فَالْيَوْمَ تُرِزَوْنَ عَذَابَ الْهُونَ what if Allah says to me that you've already taken all of your luxuries and all of your reward in the world, now there's only punishment for you. And Umar radiallahu anh is crying. 
And there are many examples of the ulama and their, and their levels of, uh, of zuhd, how they lived a life of simplicity. Abu Darda radiallahu an was one day sitting and a person came to visit him at home. And when he looked around the house of Fanadara fil bayti, falam yajid shay'an. He looked around the house of Abu Darda radiallahu an and found no possessions in there. It was an empty house. فَقَالَ يَا أَبَدْ دَرْدَى لِمَا لَمْ لَمْ أَرَى لَكَ مَتَاعًا فِي الْبَيْتِ He said, Abu Darda, why is it that I see no possessions in your home? Your home is so empty. So then he replied, he replied back by saying, the owner of this home didn't send us here to adorn it. The owner of this home didn't send us here to adorn it. The owner of this home is Allah. He sent me here to live in it, not decorate it, not adorn it. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa one day returned home. And Aisha radiallahu anha put this beautiful curtain on the wall. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to Aisha radiallahu anha, what's this? She said, well, it's this nice curtain I found and I thought it would look very nice on our, our wall, create some, 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 what do they call it? Ambiance, some, there's a word I'm thinking of. You know, some personality, it'll bring some color out on the wall, the wall will look good. So the Prophet sallallahu says that we were never commanded by Allah to clothe walls and walls and rocks. We were never told to put clothing on walls and rocks. What's this going on here? I think of that and I think to myself, Subhanallah, man, that's ajib. Because in the world that I live in, we have a lot more serious problems. You know, we put clothing on everything. You know, you know, you watch, you go on YouTube and you see videos, people buying tuxedos for their dogs and cats. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, subhanallah, was scolding Aisha radiallahu anha for putting a nice designed fabric on the wall. Allahu akbar. Salim bin Abdullah, um, rahimahullah. People came to visit him one day, and they found um, things in his home that were very minimally valued; didn't have much value. Faqila lahu fi dalik. People said to him, "What's this? You have no valuable things in your home." So then he said, Al Amru Ajalu min hada. That I don't believe that I'll be able to. He said, basically, what I'm waiting for, you know, my, uh, the, my 